And here they come rolling on in. They'll beam into the gallery here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Feel free to please turn on your camera with us today as we get rolling. We Hello, love to see everyone. smiling faces from around the world. That's Literally from Robinson. around the world. Ridge Bunter. Wait. <laughs> Ridge Bunter. <laughs> I'll get that. That way. If you want to, when you're beaming on in, type in the chat where you at in the world because this is, of course, the it's fun. Global Ethics Day, and we do want to see where we're reaching in around the world and who we're bumping into here today. And so please just drop in the chat where you're at. I'm in Washington, D.C., Rich Bontrager, better known as Trigger, uh, and I'll be one of your okay. moderators for today. And Sandra D. Robinson over on that I am side. In, I am in the country of Texas, uh, <laughs> USA. We jokingly say country of Texas because when people say, what do you think of Texas? We do have our own individual you know, mindset away from the the rest of the states. I have to say we're a little different, but I am in Austin, Texas, coming to y'all, coming to y'all from Austin, Texas. Look at yeah. everyone beaming in. Look at the friendly Alberta, folks. New York, <laughs> Philippines. Good, awesome. Teresa's from the Philippines. Coming on in, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, as you're coming on in, just briefly introduce yourself like that. It's great. In the chat, um, tell us where you're from. And I'm kind of curious too, did anyone know about Global Ethics Day before we announced this? Was anyone previously aware that this was an ongoing annual event? Because- yeah, Say yes in the chat, if you did, I, say yes in the I, chat so we yeah. can see you because there's a lot of faces, we can't see everybody at once, but if you say yes, we'll see if you say it. You knew about it. A lot of people, no, okay. No, I didn't know about it either. I, I, didn't I have know. learned a lot about this the last several months. Yes. Thanks to the World Ethics Organization and our yes. communication with them, we we now are aware of this. And it's a really good thing. They're kind of 50-50. Some people knew, some people didn't. But I think well, that it's as, perfect timing for what we're doing today. I think it's perfect timing. So as we do get rolling here today, we do want to remind we are recording this today. So please keep your microphones muted if you could. We want a good, clean recording. And we want the dialogue and everything to uh, stay with us. Uh, there will be replays available through the World Ethic. <laughs> the WEO, the World Ethics Organization's <laughs> website. I keep saying it, WEO, the short version more than the regular version. So please visit their website. We're going to share that website link with you later on and things like that. So get to know the WEO much, much, much deeper. And we will have time. We will have time, right, for people to um, to actually have some question and answer at the end of everything. So it's not that we're going to have you silenced the whole time. It just yes. for the the interview of the panel, we are going to have you guys ask you to be to be quiet. And um, we've got Kenya in the house here. Yeah. We have Sweden, Stockholm, Long Island, New York, Yorkshire. 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 Look at that. Do we say Yorkshire or Yorkshire? Yorkshire, Yorkshire, I don't know. I, I, I <laughs> North so, Vancouver, I can, I can get that one right. right. <laughs> we're going to get this thing started again. My name is Rich Bonter. I'll be one of your moderators here today. And that's Sandra D. Robinson. And uh, we are recording. We are going to have you join the conversation. So to better help you understand what you're in store for here today. Uh, Sandra, well, you want to introduce the WEO much better than when we just did. What is a <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, why don't I just go ahead and read their actual words of their mission? Yeah. Does that sound good? Okay. So the WEO, otherwise known as the World Ethics Organization, is why we're here today. They've got these awesome people together on our panel, and you're going to hear from them in just a moment. But let's give you guys the mission of the WEO so you can kind of understand where we're coming from with this. So the mission of the World Ethics Organization is to raise the visibility and the use of ethics locally and globally. We provide infrastructures, resources, opportunity for partnership, learning, practicing, and promoting an ethical mindset. Through this work, the WEO empowers people, organizations, communities, and ourselves to build a more ethical world. And if that's not enough, there's a couple of things that make the WEO unique, different. And first one is they want to build and maintain an ecosystem for ethics. That's one of the special things they want to deal with this. And it's consisting of a new and already existing organizations, communities, the global citizens who commit to bringing ethics into the marketplace and into your local region. That's one of the things that is special about them. What's the other one, Sandra? The second one is they want to generate what they call a narrative for ethics. 
Okay, so that every everyone understands the necessity for ethics and includes ethics in their everyday conversations and decisions, which don't we wish we would do this anyway, right? Helps us make the world more ethical by becoming a founding donor. You can volunteer or you can invite others to participate and we'll give you more on that a little bit later. And, and since we just kind of gave you the brief overview, here is the link, uh, drop it in the link if it's gonna work here, hopefully everybody today. Sometimes Zoom, yes, there it is. That's the link to the website. Please go and check them out, learn more about them. And we will give the opportunity to further connect with the World Ethics Organization. Um, we do wanna let you know what you're in for today. We are gonna have an opening panel discussion. We're gonna introduce our three amazing guests in just a few moments here. We are gonna have a panel discussion. Again, please leave your microphones muted. Stay active with us, uh, drop comments, encourage them during our discussion here today. Take notes because in the second half at the six o'clock hour, we'll be opening up for open Q&A and you'll be able, to, be able to drop in the chat, ask a question, ask them from a video conversation. And we'll be winding this down for sure by 6.30 PM Eastern time tonight. So Sandra, are you ready to get this show officially underway? I am, I am. So that means we have to start to bring in our wonderful panel, am I correct? Yes, it is. It's time to introduce our three rock stars. Again, we are going global with this today. I'm super excited to introduce you, Dr. Simon Longstaff, AO. So Dr. Simon Longstaff is the executive director of the Ethics Center in Sydney, Australia. Simon has been executive director of the Ethics Center for 30 years. In 2013, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia. That's the AO for distinguished service to the community through the promotion of ethical standards in governance and business to improving corporate responsibility and to philosophy. Simon is an adjunct professor at the Australian Graduate School of Management at UNSW, a fellow of CPA Australia, the Royal Society of NSW, and the Australian Risk Policy Institute. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have you with us here today. Up next, Ann Skeet. Ann is a Senior Director of the Leadership Ethics at Marcule Center for the Applied Ethics, Santa Clara University. Her work focuses on the ethical dilemma of leaders and followers and business ethics with a particular interest in healthy corporate culture, corporate, corporate governance, and ethical leadership practices. It's all grounded in the emphasis of human flourishing, which I know we'll get into here today. Her research has explored how to make ethics pervasive in organizations, and she has an author, she has authored numerous research papers and other materials. Welcome, Anne Skeet, live with us now. Thanks for having me, Rich. Sandra. Welcome, Anne. Welcome, Anne. And then our third pan panel member is Dr. Walter Earl Fluker. He is the founder of Walter Earl Fluker and Associates. He holds several prominent academic positions, including being a distinguished professor at the Howard Thurman Center, Hartford University for Religion and Peace, and a professor emeritus of ethical leadership, formerly the Martin Luther King Jr. Chair at Boston University. He is renowned for his expertise in ethical leadership and has contributed significantly to the field through his many respected publications in the last 15 years. Welcome, Dr. Walter. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be with you and this panel. Well, and we're going to get everyone the... else. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everyone else. Yes. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you, all three of you for taking time to be with us and being a part of the pre-promotion and making this all come together with the World Ethics Organization. So let's get this started a little bit here. And Dr. Walter, we're going to have you go first, but briefly, in a few comments, what is leadership and ethics all about? I think I mentioned to you the other day, Rich, and thank you uh, again for having me and I'm so excited about the conversation we're going to have uh, between the three of us and with the uh, larger audience. I told you the other day, leadership is a lot like love. It's a many splendored and splintered thing. Uh, there is such a plethora of definitions and theories about leadership and what constitutes a leader. Uh, for me, I borrowed this from Howard Gardner, who is a professor of education at Harvard. And I told him I borrowed it, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, he says a leader is an individual and sometimes a group of individuals 
who significantly influence, and that word is key, the thinking, feelings, and behaviors of a significant number of people. So with that definition, I like to think that my mother was quite a leader. She was the mom of 10 children. I'm the last, mm -hmm. and she led our family along with my father. But leaders in institutional settings, leaders in bureaucracies, uh, tend to have something else going on beyond our common day life worlds and moral codes. They are responsible uh, for organizations, institutions, and the perpetuation of traditions. And this uh, brings us uh, to four with the question of ethics. And I'll just throw this out as, as, as raw meat for my other conversation partners. Uh, I like to think of ethics as the analysis and interpretation of moral language or moral systems. I, I, we use ethics and morality interchangeably, but a very important distinction, I think, especially for leaders and especially institutional leaders, whether in government, business, science, uh, I think it's important to think of ethics as a tool, an analytical tool, which allows us to interpret different systems of morality, because everybody's morality is not the same. Ooh. And it's helpful for leaders to make uh, critical decisions, often uh, based upon the data at hand or what experience has brought them. So it's important to have tools, and ethics for me represents one of those tools. Fantastic. Thank you, Walter. And coming to you, what's what's your kind of kickoff statement about leadership and ethics? Well, I think that um, I think of leadership ethics as a practice. So rather, I think it's more helpful than talking about leaders as being ethical or unethical or people being ethical or unethical. It's better to think about this sort of compilation of practices, kind of like a yoga practice, things that you can do to, uh, you know, stretch certain muscles or deepen your ability to accomplish things. And I and I talk about it um, as sort of uh, the impact that leaders can have. So if you have uh, good practices of ethical leadership, then you can have a greater impact. And it's sort of this combination of being and doing. So it's both how you show up in the world, your personal mastery of yourself, your own integrity, your ability to empathize with people, to provide hope to others. Um, all of those are sort of elements of character that are important for leaders. And that's kind of foundational, sort of uh, kind of table stakes, if you will, and, and how you appear. But then there are things that leaders can actually do to encourage more ethical behavior. And we can talk more about those as the conversation unfolds, but um, each one of those, whether it's building community or um, sort of clarifying the thing, culture when things go wrong, um, each one of those actions contributes to the kind of impact that the, the overall impact that the leader can have. And I think uh, one of the things that ethical leaders do best is they're always very clear about whose interests they represent and they're always keeping those interests uh, forefront. And it's almost always the case that those interests are not the leader's own interests. In other words, they're oriented towards other people and they're making decisions with care and concern for others in mind. So I think, you know, I like to think of myself as a hopeful person uh, typically, but I do think it's true that we're living in a time of broken trust. And so I think those ethical leadership practices put into, into place can really help rebuild trust. I think, um, simply put, ethical leaders do make decisions with care and concern for others in mind, and we need more leaders who are functioning that way. Wow, what a great way to launch up. Right? Dr. Simon, you get to bring it home now. Come on. <laughs> so many questions are going through my mind right now, but I can yeah. see Walter was shaking his head up and down. But I want to make sure that we get to Simon as well. So Simon, what are your thoughts on leadership and ethics? Well, first of all, hello, everybody. And thanks for inviting me to join you from the Antipodes at the other end of the world. Um, 
I tend to think, first of all, of a distinction between management and leadership. And I've got a simple little model. Imagine a cork in a stream and the cork's flowing along in the water. And there's one group of people who want to keep the cork upright and everybody dry. And so they're moving around and pushing things and no one's falling in the water. And that's management. But they go wherever the stream happens to take the cork, whereas leaders impart direction. And so they don't just go where it is. They challenge it. They steer it. They make sure it goes where it ought. And so for me, the model of leadership that I have in mind is that leadership is effectively the practice of constructive subversion. So this, this process of, of, of subversion of unthinking custom and practice, which I think is the core of ethics, where you actually bring in a reflective practice rather than just following the, the lines that have already been laid down. You don't do it to impose your own idiosyncratic view of the world onto others. But I think in an organisational context in particular, what you're helping the organisation to do is to become more like the thing it says it actually wants to be. That's why it's constructive. So you help it to realise its own values, its own principles, by challenging those things which run counter to it. And that's why I think the highest virtue of leadership, this kind of ethical leadership, is moral courage. Because almost no one wants you to do it. Um, despite the fact we often talk about leadership, when you go and say to someone, um, well, why are we doing this and should we change it? They'll say, oh, can you just, come, why are you asking me these questions? You know, we've been doing it this way for ages. So that's a, in a nutshell for me, that's, that's what it's about. It's about constructive subversion in order to help organisations become aligned to what they say they stand for in terms of their core values and principles. Wow. All right, Sander, you're going to follow that up now. <laughs> and you get to go with the first question. <laughs> well, I see people in the chat that are saying, I, I like what he's saying. I think people are really identify what you were saying there, Simon. So our first question that we're going to pose to the group and answer in any order that you would like, we're just going to attack this. According to Latsu, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Is it important for ethical leaders to maintain a low profile? I'll jump in. Uh, I've always believed that humility is not a liability, uh, especially for leaders. Uh, but invisibility is dangerous for a leader. A leader needs to show up in her, his, or their bodies. And uh, people need to understand a leader needs to show up in her, his, or their bodies. And uh, people need to understand that, yes, as Simon said, leaders must have courage, but I think foundational, not but, I, and I think foundational to moral courage is integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, a deep sense of not just telling the truth, speaking the truth, but it has to do with what Anne uh, called character. Uh, integrity is one attribute of character. It's not the only one, but it certainly feeds the courage and what I'm going to call the leader uh, as, as a recognized leader. It's, there's, there's a great uh, story that um, um, Robert Greenleaf plays with about, you know, Leo, the leader in in, in servant leadership who is invisible and shows up at the end. Uh, I believe that's uh, very important, but different contexts and different situations, leaders need to be recognized. And that's part of the work of moral courage. Thank you. Anybody else gonna comment on this leadership role and where they step out, stay back? I might just jump in because I, I really agree with Walter about context mattering. There are times when you do need to be very present um, and to inspire. And, and Anne was talking a lot about that capacity of a person's character to be present and to enable others to have hope sometimes or to have a, a sense of what's possible or even to reconcile the damaging, dangerous path that's already been traversed. But the one other thing I'd add to that is that leaders tend not always to understand that the shadow they cast is broader than just the things they say and do. So there's the immediate actions, the immediate words you engage in. But as a leader, you also have an impact on the lives of people 
according to the systems, policies and structures that you either put in place or allow to exist, which send themselves all sorts of messages about what's really important. And quite often, the most significant risk to ethics in an organisation is the perception of hypocrisy. We say one thing, but we do something else. Wherever that happens, it generates cynicism, which is like an acid that eats away at the bonds of an organisation or a community. And most often, it's not necessarily to be seen in the things that are said or done by the individual leader, but it's carried by those systems and policies and structures, things which seem incredibly boring, but they carry meaning. And people say, well, if we say this, why do we do that? And surely that means they don't believe it, really. It's all just a lot of rhetoric. And that's what starts this disintegration, the, the destruction of integrity within organisations. So I think one of the things that's a bit tricky about it is that leaders need to understand that there is their own personal charism, the way they act in the world. But there's all these other things that they have a responsibility for, which also bear meaning. Well, that's going to lead us right into the next question. I, I think you live as hanging. They're really, really good. Just as a role model, leaders are role models or probably should be role models maybe, but is it just enough for leaders to act ethically or should leaders be teaching the principles to their followers? Is it actions or is it teaching or both? And what do you think? Well, I think leaders need to walk and chew gum at the same time. So I think it's both. I think that they need to be aware of how they're showing up in the world and whether or not others might see their behavior as ethical but they absolutely need to be able to teach. Uh, and I think there's lots of different ways to teach. So um, that can take many different forms. In organizations, it can be um, using the purpose and mission and vision and values of the organization consistently to make decisions and sort of always coming back to that. Uh, in this day of disruptive technologies um, coming online so rapidly, a lot of organizations are developing principles, principles around the use of responsible technology or responsible AI or however they're choosing to articulate it. And so principles are another way of teaching or guiding people to know what's considered ethical in an organization. Um, yeah, so I think they have to be, they think they have to be able to do both. And I think there's plenty of research that supports that, um, you know, people learn by doing. So you want also to allow people to put what you're teaching them into practice and be giving them sort of continuous feedback about how that is relating to what's considered ethical in an organization. I love the walk and chew gum. That's <laughs> anybody else got anything better than walk and chew gum on this right now? <laughs> I couldn't agree with Ann more um, about principled embodied leadership. Uh, to use Simon's language, leaders being present, not uh, morally superior, which is very important, but being present for the other at deep levels of connectivity, which implies there is authentic communication. In order to build trust in any group, but particularly in organizations, institutions, uh, demonstrating integrity and accountability allows for these connections that build trust. And leaders without trust are in very dangerous situations, not only of destroying organizations and people, but actually uh, hurting themselves. So m m much of the self-destructive uh, behavior that we see among leaders uh, grows out of this lack of ability to embody uh, certain principles and practices. And I love Anne's language around practices, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk a bit more about practices and <coughs> what are the best practices. Simon, jump in, please. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, I think there's another thing that leaders can do, which is really helpful for others who are in, in their sphere, whether it's in an organisation or, or in life. And that is that um, it's to take some of the pressure off people. A lot of people, when they hear talk about ethics, they say, oh, well, does that mean I have to be perfect or, or something like that? 
And in fact, ethical perfection, for reasons I won't go into now, is actually strictly impossible to achieve in every circumstance. And that can be a great relief uh, once you realise that. And there are two extreme models that people often think that exist around ethics and how one lives one life. One model is that you've got to be willing at any moment to throw yourself onto the funeral pyre of integrity. And there you are, you burn up and you're gone and there's some beautiful sparks and all that's left is some ashes. That's one model. The other end of it is that you're like a little rabbit and people pat you and you sit on the roadway of life and people say, isn't it nice? And they're ethical. And then there's a big truck bearing down called reality and you're destined to be nothing more than roadkill. And people say, well, that's not it either. And I think what leaders can do is that they can say, actually, you don't have to destroy yourself in every moment and you don't have to be run over. There's another space and it's that ability to translate ethical leadership into, to go back to Anne's language, into a form of practice which is nimble. It's brave, yes, but it's also nimble and it's creative and it, and it generates inflection points. And you, you don't have to be destroyed all along the way and you can accept your limitations and be perhaps offering nothing more than both your sincerity and your, your skill and capacity. That's the thing that counts. So I'm, I'm going to hop in here because I think that there's a little, little rabbit hole that I want to go down. Okay. Rabbit hole. So, well, we mentioned, you know, want to talk about, well, just said to talk about practices. I'm like, well, yes, then you mentioned practices. And, and before we even got started, I said, let's make sure that we give people something that they can actually recognize, walk away with and take action on. So what, let's talk about practices. Like what is it, what is an example of how people can practice this? on a regular basis and like in a very common situation, what what's an example of that? Let's talk about practices. Well, one of the practices of ethical leadership that we talk about is the conscious creation of community, being intentional about weaving together uh, networks of moral support, you know, and, and, and bringing people together and seeing themselves as part of something uh, that helps people to be aware of the other and to be thinking about others and, and their relationship to them. And so it's a fundamental part of the individual ethical leadership practice, but it's also one of those things that leaders can do to contribute to the creation of healthy culture. So yep. that's one and practice. Is, does this, when you're talking about this, does this refer to like actual, just something as simple as being in a meeting, making sure everybody has a voice, or is it more than that? It can be that. It can be in a meeting uh, using those sort of uh, best inclusivity practices, if you will, and um, being sure that everybody feels part of it. But I also think it's how when people come together, uh, they think about their time together, whether they think about it as just momentary and we're here to do this one thing, or whether they see themselves as coming together in a way, in a cohesive way, that's going to have some lasting connection to one another. And I think that's, particularly when you're in an institutional or organizational leadership role, you want to have people feel like they're there um, for the long term, because uh, some of the best ethical decisions are made over the long term, not just with the short term uh, immediate pressures that are facing you as you're making that decision, but you need to be thinking about the downstream effects of those decisions and the longer term implications. Well, one of the simplest things you can do as a practice is to actually use the language of ethics, of values and principles to explain the decisions you're making. Uh, there's, there's a phenomenon that was, it was coined in the 1980s, but you can still see it called the moral muteness of managers. It was a really interesting thing. What happened was people would make decisions for good ethical reasons and then they'd pretend that they hadn't because they were embarrassed. They'd say, oh, well, if I, if I offer my values and principles, they'll be contestable because of what Walter was talking about before because there are different moral frameworks that people use. So I, 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 won't, I won't make it about ethics. I'll, I'll say it's actually about good for the bottom line or it's about strategy and I'll give any reason except that it's got to do with alignment with my values and principles. So a really simple thing you can do just to start conditioning the environment and to enable people to feel comfortable about this is say, actually, I will explain that this choice is informed by these values and these principles, hopefully ones that other people engage with, and go from there. And that itself can be transformative because they suddenly say, all right, it's okay to put that on the table. We can have a discussion. So that's one very simple thing that can be done. Down, deeper and farther down the rabbit hole, I, I just think this is a great place. When I work with leaders from all sorts, 
I'm interested in three domains that cover practices, if you or categories, character, the lovely language of Anne, <laughs> civility. Kind of let that sink a little bit. And community, character, civility, and community. And for each, I locate three pra practices. They're not exhaustive. But for character, I'm really huge on the personal development of the leader. And these practices are integrity, as you heard, empathy, and hope. There could be others. Aristotle would have his and ex but from the African American moral traditions that I studied in the 80s or 90s, we actually interviewed and combed through texts of uh, outstanding leaders from various traditions, but especially African American moral traditions. Uh, and these three traits, some people call them attributes, uh, for me are virtues, and they must be practiced because they're habit, they're habitual. Character has to be located, however, in public space. And public space for me is a place where civility becomes very, very important, which just simply means that I should not maim you, injure you physically or psychologically, or even kill you because I disagree with you. And uh, civility, therefore, becomes a kind of etiquette or manner of, uh, I like to call democratic living. Not everyone is into democratic living. But I think that in order for democracies to exist, persist over time, transformative civility becomes very significant. And finally, community, and I won't take much time there, but there I list of what I call virtuosities. Can you say that without spitting? Say virtuosities. <laughs> uh, these are excellences, moral excellences. And there, uh, Simon, I locate courage, justice, and compassion. Uh, and I, 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 justice and compassion are so important for me because justice without compassion can be very dangerous. And compassion without justice can be weak and empty. And so I encourage leaders to think about these three broad categories as practices. There are certainly other models, but uh, I'm convinced that at this point in our lives and organizations, uh, we need to think more, especially about civility as being the glue that hold character and community together. So let me jump in here because civility, I think, is part of that bridge as this is Global Ethics Day. We're not the only one talking about this today. The Carnegie Foundation is doing it. Other organizations are doing it. The World Ethics Organization is having this platform here, but it is Global Ethics Day. So civility, I think, is part of the bridge to discussing global ethics. And what does a leader do? How do leaders bridge that gap? What are some action points, some tips to help us become more global leaders? and actually talk about ethics on a larger scale because it's icky. People don't want to talk about ethics. So what can we do as leaders to make the conversation happen better, stronger around the world, do you think? Well, one of the things that you just, just even talking about ethics is icky, I think brings up this idea that when people hear that word, sometimes they feel judged or they feel uh, concerned about how they're going to show up. And as Simon pointed out, it's impossible to be ethically perfect. So um, we need to make room for human imperfection. And in fact, um, lots of uh, human error uh, contributes to unethical behaviors. Just people are tired or they're hungry or there's lots of things pressing in on them. And all of those things can contribute to how we respond in certain situations. And that's why uh, talking about ethics as human flourishing, I think, is so much more uh, useful. Um, it's really the search of uh, the good life and the practice of making good moral decisions. And um, I think when it's framed that way, it's much easier for people to connect to it and easier for people in a variety of cultures to be able to identify what is human flourishing in my culture and uh, in my community. 
We're going to come back to that. But I want yeah, to there's that right word. Now. We're, we're <laughs> going to come back to that. Who else yeah. had the comment on this one? On the, um, if you look at the world, there's, there's a tension between the fact there is a universal structure throughout all cultures and all times around what leads humans to make choices. So the structure is consistent across, and that's around people are driven to make choices about what they think is good. So if you put an apple and an orange in a room and someone walks in, there's only four possible choices, an apple, an orange, both or none. And so if you watch the person pick up the apple, you say, well, I, okay, I can tell now. They think of those four choices. That's the best one. And so there's a series of things that people believe that are good, which will drive their choices. And there are principles that regulate how you go about getting the things that are good. So somebody might say, I value harmony, but say, I'll get harmony by killing everybody who disagrees with me. And then I'll have harmony. And people say, well, hey, hang on, that's not right. And so what's good and what's right, those values and principles are constantly there as structures. Now, what changes is the content of those structures. In some places, harmony is prioritised over liberty, as is the case in, say, China. In places like the States, you'd prioritise liberty over harmony. You'd, you'd let people burn your flag and dance in the ashes. You don't like it, but, you know, they can do it. Um, and so there are these tensions there and how they're expressed. But the big challenge is, I think, that when you try and introduce these conversations is that we're all too ready to try and change people's minds about why they're wrong. And I've found through harsh experience, you know, where I've made the mistake, I've been trying to engage with people, that actually the best way to have these conversations about ethics is not to try and tell people that they're wrong and how they should see the world. It's actually to listen to them and to take other people entirely seriously and to engage with them in their worldview and start to do that. So it goes back to Walter's point about humility, I think, that you don't have to set yourself up as being the arbiter of what's right and wrong or good or bad. You can actually be much more relaxed about it and engage in good faith conversations using what philosophers like me call the principle of charity, where you really try to get into the, the shoes of the other person. And I think when you do that, then what starts to emerge is a whole series of ties which are common, which unite people across all sorts of apparent boundaries. And then you suddenly find actually maybe they do it slightly differently, but they actually hold the same value. A good example, friendship. Now, lots of people believe in friendship, but in my country, you probably express friendship by spending time sharing a meal or hanging out together and things like that. But there are other countries in my own region where friendship is initiated with a ritual of gift giving and exchange. And if you don't understand that that is actually the same value, but being expressed in a slightly different way, you can get into all sorts of hot water. Oh, what are you trying to do? This isn't appropriate and things like that. So my, my thing about the global position is we should be humble about our own position. We should listen far more and we should be prepared to take entirely seriously the claims that other people make and then start to see what emerges from that. You know, an, Love interest, it. an interesting uh, conversation uh, that goes on, especially nowadays, is is the idea of empathy. And simply stated, you know, sitting where the other sits, or feeling, mm -hmm. or at least stretching oneself uh, to feel what the other feels. I think empathy to um, <clears throat> hopefully reinforce what I think I heard Simon say that's not a pun but the um empathy i think has also to lead us to respect for the inherent dignity and worth mm -hmm. of the other and then i'm perhaps in a position to begin to talk with the other about a sense of justice not justice as procedural justice, but as a sense of justice. What is fair in this case for this person or these people? Uh, but without empathy, I think it's hard to get to that place of respect for the dignity of the other, for the other's worth. I think that's so important, Walter. Thank you so much for saying that. I'm That's right up my alley. So I, I want to just kind of bring that home a little bit here. Somebody had put into the chat that ethics training a lot of times feels like um, like they're being, I think she used a different word, but it's, it's faded already. 
scolding, basically, that, that it's a correction, that it's um, a disciplinary action. Um, is there anything that you can advise people in the corporate environment to be able to make it seem a little bit more, a little less corrective and more constructive? Well, it's partly to do with the word. I mean, I know the first time I wandered over to your neck of the woods to the United States, um, when I went and visited people to talk about ethics, they were actually talking about something completely different. They were talking about compliance. Uh, so there were a lot of ethics officers and things like that. They were really lawyers who were trying to make people obey rules rather than dealing with the more complex and interesting questions that I thought we'd be talking about. But then, So sometimes I think you know, the, the word ethics um, means different things even in, in, in certain contexts. Uh, but I think it should be one of the most exciting things people can do. Um, it's, it's like, uh, I, I think really good, um, we'll call it ethics education or training, is a little bit like getting into an advanced driving school where you go on a skid pad and you, and you learn, you know, because everybody learns when you're driving. You know, you're told to put your foot on the brake when you're heading towards danger. Well, it's the worst thing to do if you're on a slippery road or a muddy track or something like that. You actually have to slightly accelerate out, so it's counterintuitive. And ethics is about, you know, the good training is where you have the conversations about the tricky situations where it's good versus good, it's right versus right, where maybe your best option isn't really great at all. It might be your least bad option. And then you start to say, well, how do we navigate these things? How do we do that? Now, that's fun because you start to play. You start to think about things and you've got a sense of freedom rather than this is the rule and this is the code and you sign that and you tick off and comply. And, and I'm hoping that things are evolving more in the direction of what I think is really great ethics education and engagement away from what I think it has been for a lot of people. Of that. Anyone else want to chime in on that? That was wonderful. I, I do want to say, I think teaching ethics and teaching leadership can be fun. I think it can be fun. Um, one of the exercises I like working with leaders, and there are several, uh, is uh, placing them in a cave. It's based on Plato's allegory of the cave. Some of us may have read that in grade school or college. But the idea is we actually uh, create a cave. And uh, they have to act out the allegory in the cave. And there are some who come along and free others. But it's the most exhilarating experience because it teaches us deep things about moral, not rectitude, but moral disposition and practice. Um, how deeply do I care about the other who is bound? who is lost to history and lost to memory. How might I find the other to use Anne's language and be with the other and participate in the other's liberation as I liberate myself? Those are huge ethical issues that we confront daily in our yeah, personal Walter, lives and in our environments. If I can jump in, Walter, I've, I've been thinking about the cave a lot lately because I think there are a lot of people who are chaining themselves back to the log. <laughs> they they, they the say, I, I, I want a simple world. I, show me shadows. Don't show me a three-dimensional world of colour. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the interesting things about it is not everybody wants to be liberated because you suddenly encounter a world which is more complex where you've got to think about it. You can't just go along with the flow. Uh, I don't know what is happening in the States, but, you know, over here, people are feeling exhausted. And so there's another side to this where they, they say, just make life simple, but it's not. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting challenge when you encounter people who prefer to be left to their own devices like that. This is a really rich conversation. The chat box is going, by the way, just full of hearts and mojo, handcuffs, okay. conversation. Someone in the chat box threw in there the idea of curiosity. You must be curious to dive into this ethical conversation. Mm -hmm. If you're not curious, you're just kind of shield up, you're not going to go for it. So, and I do want to go back to that human flourishing. You and I have talked about this before, and I'm fascinated by the concept because I don't think people understand at all what this is about and how powerful that word phrase is. Can you just share a little bit about that briefly? Well, I, I'm not sure I can say much more than I have already in, in, in that it is 
each person's opportunity to pursue a good life. And I think when you keep ethics in a positive frame, you do much better. You're, you're much more likely to engage people around the consideration of what is ethical than if you put it in a negative frame. And I think once you put it in a negative frame, you've gone back to what Simon was talking about. You're really in the compliance mode. You're really talking about, here are some rules that need to be followed. Have you followed them or not? Are you good or bad? Those kind of very binary things. But if you can keep the conversation around how do we each uh, identify and discover uh, a good life and our opportunity to flourish in it, then you're, it's a much more open stance. And you're much more likely to be doing, again, as Simon was talking about, you know, active listening to other people and have some curiosity about their story and why they think what they think. That's why, you know, the, we work with a framework for ethical decision-making at the Markle Center, and it's uh, got several steps to it, of, you know, getting some facts and identifying you have an ethical issue and engaging stakeholders in the process, all of those, again, those practices. But at the core of it are these lenses uh, that are intended to synthesize some of the uh, best ethical thinking over the ages. And we offer them all as questions. They, you know, what does the greatest good or the least harm? What, uh, you know, respects the rights and dignity of all people involved? Um, what allows me to be the best person I can be? And all of those embody different ways of thinking about things, utilitarianism or human rights or the virtue ethics. But in reality, they're just really great questions. And every decision is an ethical decision at its core uh, if you are trying to make it with the consideration of other people in mind. And so it's just, I, I think if you can stay in that, that place of inquiry, of inquisitiveness about other people and what they're thinking, um, and and some interest in their human flourishing, uh, it's far more effective and a, a better makes ethics more accessible to more people. There so was, I'm, I'm, can, I, can I jump in? This is such yeah. a great thing about flourishing. So it, the, it's it's an evolution in our understanding of a word, an ancient Greek word called eudaimonia, and it used to be mistranslated um, by all sorts of people as happiness. And so it used to be that the, the end of human life was happiness. And people said, oh, that, okay, so we all have to be happy and all the rest. But in fact, as Anne um, has said, the proper translation of the word is flourishing. And the good thing about flourishing is it's a much richer notion. You don't have to be happy all the time to live a flourishing life. You can have moments of sadness or boredom and things, but you there's it's the overall, it's like a bush, you know, you see a, or a tree, you know, you can see it's flourishing. It's got that that wholeness or to it. And it's the other sense of integrity. It's not just that you are what you say you are, but all of the parts relate properly to the whole. But another aspect to it, which I found really interesting, was that I was listening to the, the famous Italian author, Umberto Eco, uh, talking years ago. And he was trying to distinguish between the modern world and the ancient world. And he said, the difference is that the modern world has celebrities and the ancient world had heroes. And he said that... The modern world is all about glittering surfaces, whereas the ancient world had depth. And in fact, it's captured again in the ancient Greek language. So the word, uh, this is a bit of trivia, you might not think it's important, but the word for beauty, halos, is the same word for honour that the Greeks yes. used. And the word for ugliness, aishron, is the same word for shame. And so there was a sense in which it was a whole thing that had to be together, not just the surfaces, but the depth. And so this flourishing concept that Anne's talking about is that wholeness of it, um, but it allows you to have the fully human experience without having the glittering surface of the happy moment and nothing more of depth to a life. And I think it's a really wonderful thing then when you start to see it in this way. And to go back to the point about curiosity, I think, just to comment on that, I think the whole notion of a culture of curiosity is a wonderfully liberating thing because in, in Australia, we have all these organisations that talk about a thing called a speak up culture, where you speak up when you see something wrong and you've got to be really brave and it must be terrible and things. Whereas I think, no, why do you have to wait then? Why not just have a culture of curiosity where you wonder, why do we do the things that we're doing? You know, And it doesn't have to be a bad thing, it can be a good thing. And if you're curious about it, you can ask questions. And then I think that that's part of it. And then you think of the organisation itself that can flourish, not just the individual. 
I'd like to well, add to the uh, here, flourishing yeah. and then of, uh, I'll be certainly human flourishing. And we have become the center of the universe, but flourishing is a natural metaphor in some ways. And uh, so human flourishing depends upon nature, our environment, our natural environment flourishing. So part of the connectiveness uh, that Anne is uh, suggesting has to be connected to our planet. And if one of the most pressing, urgent, precarious issues, moments of our existence as Homo sapiens uh, is the matter of climate change. And uh, I think that flourishing ought to be human and maybe non-human flourishing, our natural environment, animals, dogs, cats, ants, plants. Thanks. I, I, I love, I'm so glad you brought that forward, Walter. I just want to um, share with you some work that we're doing uh, in a different realm than ethical leadership, but of course connected, which is this idea of the responsible or the development of responsible technologies. And so uh, recently did some work and wrote a book that looks at um, ethics in the age of disruptive technology and sort of how we think about that and what companies can do. And we offer an anchoring principle in our work that is that our action should be for the common good of humanity and the environment. And one of the guiding principles is that we share the planet with all living things, not just human beings. And I think it's really important to keep those things at the forefront right now as we're making decisions uh, as a society about that will have long-term effects on the environment, the planet that future generations will inherit. So I'm so glad you brought that forward. And, and again, it's such a, um, I think, uh, critical piece of human flourishing. Well, Sandra, that's kind of in your area, this whole- It is. <laughs> animals and everything. So yeah. take it over. I I do nature-based training, and so that's kind of my mission. So I was so happy that this turned in this direction for myself. Um, but, you know, it's not just, there, there's so many different aspects, and I see things that are popping up in the chat. And Jason said something a little bit earlier that maybe we can touch on briefly, because we also want to get to more of the AI comment. There's so much that we could be talking about here that keeps coming up. But Jason put in something that I thought, you know, really kind of hits home, I think, for a lot of people, where he said, ethics, really, the conversation starts in the home, in the family. And do you guys have anything to say about that? Maybe not. <laughs> they're sound, they're, they're well, silent I, for the I first think, time. <laughs> oh. par well, parents are your first teachers, right? So yeah. um, back to the whole uh, importance of being willing to teach ethics. In fact, you, it's not just what you do, but it's also what you teach and, and that there are lots of different ways to teach. So certainly parents and extended family members, not just parents, but family are the first teachers for, for young people. And um, it is where people are introduced to ethics for the first time. So I, I, was just, I was gonna say- I was just thinking about, people used yeah. to come over to our house when I was growing up. And I think that we all hate each other because we'd be sitting around the table, sort of you know, having these really intense conversations about, things like that and you know we all loved each other really deeply but we would sort of be getting stuck into the arguments and things. i was thinking about some of the scenes that you see when families really get into this stuff it's uh it's amazing um but no it's it's look i think it's uh and it's such an enriching way for people to engage when they they go because it, it does touch everything like yeah you know, people don't realize i think oh ethical questions like the big things like capital punishment or voluntary assisted dying and things but it's also when you go to the supermarket you know you're sitting there and you're looking at what eggs you're going to buy is it going to be from free range chooks or birds that live in cages it's every i think walter made the point really it's every choice you make is ultimately an ethical decision and so if you can bring it back to everyday life within the home and give children the capacity to start developing a sense of how to talk about these things without necessarily having to be imposed upon as to what to think about it that's, I think, the really useful thing that you can do. Well, it also brings up the the curiosity aspect that we were talking yeah. about just a little bit ago to yeah. really, I think, to, you know, as you were saying, to really, when it comes to raising some kiddos, actually really encourage them to be curious um, first, mm. maybe. 
yeah. my mind Roger. went so many places uh, while, while we were there. One is the matter of prenatal care. So we do begin in, in family, but we also began before there, that place. And one of the big ethical issues on here in the US is prenatal care. And how do we begin to interrogate some of the assumptions and beliefs about health, you know, which takes it to a broader terrain. And whose health are we talking about? The disproportionality between certain uh, communities and others. And I know this is a global issue, so I bring that forth. I also thought, uh, as we were talking, is about what everybody is complaining about, no matter where you go, is the deterioration or the decay of civil society or civil society institutions, family, religious institutions, education, and so on. And uh, I think what's at stake in this conversation, as we talk about deep-seated issues like community, communitas, um, it's how do we reimagine we may not go back, for instance, to where we were in uh, pre-modernity. <laughs> no, we won't. We won't even go back to modernity, I don't think, in some classical ways. But how do we reimagine our futures ethically? I, I, I think that's such an important thing, Walter. Uh, yeah. I, I reckon we're at what I describe as the end, I hope we're near the end, of what I call a long age of forgetting. And during this long age of forgetting, what we have forgotten is the purpose of the institutions that were established sometimes millennia ago. It's as if the um, the foundations have, have been ignored and have been allowed to, to rot or decay. And so you see institutions that may have st stood very well over many centuries start to fall, particularly under conditions of rapid change. So you take something like a market, you know, what's the basic idea of a market? Well, there's two people who meet at a forward in a stream. One has wool, one has wheat, one hungry, one's cold, and they exchange. It's a fair exchange to benefit both. But you forget that. You become distracted by all of the things that are built around it. And so I think what we could do, and this is to build on your point, is imagine how exciting it would be to go back and ask, what is the purpose of a university or a religious institution or of a parliament? What, what do they actually exist to do? And even though the answers might be the same ones that emerged when our forefathers and mothers generated them centuries, millennia, whenever ago, the difference would be this, that for the first time in all that time, they would be answers invested with life. They'd be our answers. We could see them and we could ask them what they're supposed to do and then see, are they capable of delivering on that? So I think what you've introduced, Walter, is an absolutely marvellous invitation to reimagine the world and its institutions and to build them from the ground up again in a way that's fresh and vital. So I love reimagining. I'm a Disney freak. I admit it. But Walter, you just put, boom, you, great job. By the way, we are one hour and yeah. we've got another 30 minutes to go. But first, I do want everyone to take a breath, relax for a second. We are going to put in the chat right now. The World Athletes Organization, the WEO, that's bringing this to you today, they have a questionnaire. They want to learn more about you, what you're interested in. Would you want to volunteer to help grow this nonprofit organization? Would you want to financially support them as we do these events and other ones like that? So look at this form, take a look at it, and fill it out. Please submit it back because the World Ethics Organization would love to know more about you. And if you don't know anything about the WEO, I am going to also drop in the chat again. I mean, we have people coming in, in and out, in and out. This is for their website. Go check out the World Ethics Organization. They're also on LinkedIn. If you are regularly using LinkedIn, it's a great communication tool. And go and uh, click on that, follow them. Uh, these type of conversations are going to continue through the World Ethics Organization. Uh, we just happen to be here, Sandra and I, to help kick this off today in this amazing forum this second half now, we are going to open it up to you. And what I want to mention is, please keep your microphones muted. Use the digital hand, if you could, the little digital button that pops up. You'll move to the front of the line. We can bring you in. 
and we ask for short questions because we want to keep this moving. I'm going to ask the panelists also to keep their answer a little bit more limited so we can keep everyone moving. They're going to populate this box as fast as they can, everybody. And we're going to see how many questions we can get. Now that we've kind of lit the fuse and opened it up, uh, let's see what we can reimagine here for the next 30 minutes. So uh, I am going to bring in Oliver. We're going to let you join and come on in, Oliver. And thanks for joining us. And what's your question for the panel? Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, I wanted to ask the panelists uh, what the definition of problem solving is in an ethical context and how that maybe compares to other contexts like mathematical problem solving. Is there anything in the literature and academia? You guys are like obviously trained at us, so I'd love to know. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, stab is such a terrible word when you're talking <laughs> about problem solving. I just thought I'd say that. Um, when I when when I teach ethics for leaders, I give them five frames. Anne has already identified them. Uh, historically, in Western traditions, there are a whole lot of ways to do ethics, but I, I list five. One is is the ethics of obligation. Another is consequences. Another is virtue relation. But the one I find the most fascinating is the, I simply call it the retooler. It's really a pragmatic, pragmatist is a better word, model of doing ethics. And I'll give you a great example, if you can bear with me. I'm a terrible, terrible um, hands-on person. I've tried all my life to do that. And one day I got home and my car wouldn't start. I a guy comes by to help me. I make a long story short. And he says, where are your jumper cables? And I said, I don't have jumper cables. And he looked around. And he said, yeah, there's some in the back. There was an old rusty cable set. And he grabbed them. He put them on my car. That didn't work. Then he scraped off the calcium, all this stuff. And finally, he got my car going. And I turned to him and I said, sir, you are a bricolure. You are a handy person. You take the materials at hand and you reconfigure them to the need at hand. Doing ethics often, I want to say consistently, requires that we do the work of bricolage, of taking materials at hand and refashioning them into things that present us with ethical possibilities. It doesn't mean you disparage or disregard the other ways of doing ethics, but often we're at a place where it takes a pragmatist to answer the question. And this is part also of the reimagining that I'm suggesting. Uh, reconstructing maybe is another word. Ethics itself, I think, is going through a transformation that is similar, especially when you speak to people like Anne, who is doing the work in AI and other forms of technology. I think there are some serious, significant conversations that need to take place. That's a long conversation. No, that, I, I appreciate that. And we're, we're going to, we could keep going, but we're going to move on. We've got four people I'm looking at. We have Michael, David, Tanya, and Richard. I know that had questions. So Michael, you are next up. Michael Pink, you are next up on my, on my uh, little squares here. So Rich, do you want to bring him up? Yeah, he's on. Michael, ask, jump on in, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question has to do with social enterprise. And and whether or not uh, it makes sense to feel, uh, as I do strongly, that if it is possible for us to satisfy our need or desire uh, for something personally or for our company, if we can acquire what we need, the product or service, pay a market price, and at the same time do good for the world, do we have an obligation to do that? Great question. Who wants to grab that one? Do we have an obligation? 
Um, I I'll have a crack at it. Um, so it's an interesting question you put, Michael, because you've basically said all things being equal, that is, the price is no greater for doing so, are you obliged yes. to opt for the thing which has the preferential effect? Um, I don't think that in general you have obligations to do uh, discretionary acts of good. I don't think that you can say it's an obligation, but I do think it's an it, it's a good thing to do, even if you're not obliged to do it. And it depends on your stance, really, as to how you see in the world. Some people are ethical egoists. They just exist entirely for themselves. They have no regard for others. They've got a very narrow pattern of concern. But it seems that if you want to live um, a flourishing life, to go back to Anne's language, to contribute to the community in which you operate with those discretionary acts, which you do because you choose to do what is good, rather than you're merely obliged to do what is good, that that has a very powerful effect in the community and it invites others to think about it too. So I, I wouldn't want to uh, endorse the claim of obligation, but I would say that it's the sort of thing that if you have the character and conviction around a certain kind of society that you would choose to do as a matter of choice rather than obligation. Shall we go to the next questions? Keep this moving, huh? What yeah. do you say, Rich? So uh, I think we have Tanya, uh, so Tanya's uh, hand up and then Richard. Take it away, Tanya. So I'm just going to be very, very um, uh, self-serving in asking Simon a specific question on what surpassed in Australia recently concerning the referendum and um, the ethical, I don't know, interpretation, you know, implications, interpretations of, of that whole experience that you just lived through. Right. So first of all, I should mention I have kinship ties with the Anindaliakwa people who are First Nations people on in the Northern Territory of Australia. Uh, and the group of us will be, they're coming down from a long way away. This is the far north of Australia. I'm getting to see some of them tomorrow, actually. Um, for those who don't know, Australia recently held a referendum, which is the process by which we changed the constitution in Australia. It requires a majority of citizens in a majority of states. Um, and there are only six, we don't have 50 plus, but we've got six of them here, to agree. And the proposition was to recognise First Nations people in our constitution by establishing a new body, which was to be a voice to parliament and a voice to government, which would be a standing body to provide advice to these bodies, but would not. Buy, it had no decision-making power. In fact, it was only even going to be determined in its operations by an act of parliament. And the proposal was defeated. Uh, it didn't get up in any state or territory. And a majority, about 60%, said no, which was very disappointing for me because personally I'd been supporting it. And the reason why it wasn't supported is because a number of, I think, misleading arguments by those who opposed it were put forward claiming that it would accord different rights to different people according to race, uh, that it would be divisive, that it wouldn't be practically useful. There was a whole lot of arguments which... Uh, I, in my own work, attempted to answer and helpfully help people make decisions. But nonetheless, that was decided. And uh, I won't go on too much about it, but uh, I think the one thing is it was not so much a rejection of recognition. I think everybody accepts that this is a country which was um, brought into existence through an act of colonisation. Um, the local Indigenous people have never ceded um this this land so like many people first nations people around the world they still claim sovereignty over it but they have we've got to go back to the drawing board now and work out what it is the public as a whole i think wants to recognize that truth about our past but they didn't want to do it by these means and we're i think people are grieving the result now and trying to work out where we go to next thank you for that, that again we we talked that back in the green room a little bit about that. So thank you for bringing that out here with us. I want to introduce Richard Messi. Uh, Richard is one of the team members from the World Ethics Organization. And Richard has a question. Richard, thanks for helping to put this all together today. Uh, what's your question, sir? Yes, I, I'm, I'm very curious uh, what you think of the most important question a person should ask themselves before they make a decision. Is the question, the most important question, is the decision I'm making going to minimize harm and or maximize benefit 
uh, with to the people that the uh, that this decision is going to impact? Is, do you think that's the ultimate question people should be asking themselves? The ethical question, the ultimate ethical question: Am I going to minimize harm and or maximize benefit to those who are going to be impacted by my decision? Dr. Walter, Richard. you want to jump on that one first? Yes, Richard. It's so good to see you. <laughs> um, I think we should always ask the question, what makes community? Simply stated. But that's never just the only question, because the question, question of consequence follows it which is basically a utilitarian argument, the greatest good for the greatest number. And that has many variations. But for me, what's at stake? And I just heard it with the referendum in Australia. What is it that creates community? Can we live in a way where diversity whether it be among humans or in nature, uh, does not threaten us. That may not be a question that human beings will quite answer. <laughs> I pray we will. <laughs> but I do know that unless we work on that question, the other questions that we raise as ethicists, I think, might not have the kind of standing or status necessary. I think the question of community is always present. How do we live together without harm, without fear, without threat, without blame, no matter what historical, social, and material force brought us to this place? How do we live together? And that is a primary ethical question, at least for me. That's my response, Richard. Thank you. That was beautiful. Sandra, who we got next? Let's see. Let me go back to my to that big screen where I can see everybody. I don't see any more hands up. Any more hands want to go up? Uh, actually, Dr. DT, there you are. Doctor, we're going to bring you on in and uh, please ask your question. So my question is for Anne because um, I was having a discussion with a colleague from another country earlier today. So what have you learned about the ethical perspective, ideas, concepts from other countries that you think would better inform how we think in the West about ethics? Love that. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, that you asked this question right after Dr. Fluker has um, spoken, because I think so many of the traditions that I've learned about uh, from other cultures really speak to community, for example. So there's African traditions that um, ground most of the moral reasoning in um, decisions about what's best for the community mm -hmm. and talk largely about relationships and recognize and would describe, you know, that each one of us has other people in them and we are in other people. So it's always about that connection and relationship right. to each other. So um, that's one tradition that I can think of that has informed some of what we think about. Um, I think uh, Simon mentioned a few others from, uh, you know, uh, certain cultures that prioritize harmony, for example, over um, other attributes. So I think there are um, things that can be learned from most traditions, most faith traditions, many different cultures. and um, we try and learn from all of them in terms of um, the, the questions that we ask that lead us to making ethical decisions. So with a few minutes left, I wanna jump in because there's been a topic we have dance around. I wanna give a little bit of time for this is AI and leadership. AI is exploding that we've all mentioned it in some fashion here today. And I know, and you've dealt with this a little bit, but what is the role of the leaderships and navigating, working with in an ethical way, this whole new ticking time bomb of AI or the benefits of AI. There's so many different ways to go with this. How does leadership help lead this in an ethical way, do you think? I think we're having a little bit of a leadership void actually when it comes to AI in the sense that um, 
it's hard for people to uh, untangle individual interests from collective interests. And it's interesting to note that some of the very people who are creating the technology are also those who are expressing the greatest concerns about it, which is kind of extraordinary if you think about it. I mean, no sooner is it being unleashed in the world than those very same leaders of those companies are, are speaking to its harms and, and their concerns about it and, um, and asking for regulation. And I think part of the reason they're doing that is they want to um, tidy up, if you will, the interests of, uh, uh, and make sure that they can represent the interests that they're supposed to be bringing to the forefront to talk about one of those practices of ethical leadership. So if you're in a company, you're supposed to be looking out for um, the customers of your uh, organization, but of course the investors too, and, um, and the employees that work there. And right now you have employees who are asking questions about whether what is being created is, is a good or is create or is going to do harm. So they're not, they can't even have the confidence that what they're creating is going to have a positive effect in the world. And um, so you're, you're seeing a lot of looking around and asking somebody else to come in and make the decisions. And you're not seeing, or I'm not seeing anyway, as much as I would like to see of the courage that Simon spoke about earlier and that Walter also mentioned in the model that he works with. Um, and sometimes that is the courage to say no, or we're not ready, or we don't yet fully understand the implications of these things. And so we need to pause uh, before we advance this technology any further. And people are wanting to put things in very binary camps. You're either for uh, the acceleration of technology and all the good that uh, advancing technologies have brought to society, or you're against it. You're trying to stifle innovation and there's, uh, and you're going to do harm by, by doing that. When, of course, we, we know there can be some effective middle ground and some uh, way to both continue to innovate and experience the best that technology can bring to us, but to do it thoughtfully and to do it in, with the anticipation of the kind of harms that it's going to unleash. So we're, we, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, was going to cut, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry about that. Anne. No, go right ahead, Simon. Um, there, there are three different areas of responsibility around AI. There's the responsible AI in terms of the formation of it, the development, the way in which code is embed an ethical foundation and then use things like blockchain to provide its provenance and things like that. There's responsibility within its exercise, which is a very problematic thing at the moment because it, we don't currently have explainable AI. We, we don't know, for example, why machine vision works any more than we know why human vision works. And so it's very hard to have that responsible. But the third one, and the one that I think that we need to spend far more time talking about, which does particularly bring leadership, is the responsibility we have for society and the context within which this is being deployed. I mean, if you believe... Um, as I do, some of the predictions about the displacement effect of modern technologies like AI and robotics in, say, the world of employment, you'll see millions of jobs, and they won't just be blue-collar jobs, they'll be white-collar jobs as well, accountants, lawyers, bankers and others being displaced. Now, you might say there'll be new kinds of work, and it may be true that there will be, but we haven't seen for hundreds of years a middle-class, white-collar displacement like that and the effects it will have. Nor have we as a society asked ourselves whether or not a meaningful life is necessarily attached to having a job, to being an employee of someone else. Because there have been plenty of societies where a meaningful life hasn't been in that. So Indigenous communities, just to go back to First Nations people, people live rich, meaningful lives, but they didn't have jobs in the sense of being employed by someone. It was a life balanced between providing for sustenance and ceremony and art and community, all the other things that were there. My society in Australia hasn't started talking about it at the political leadership. Lots of people in boards of companies are still not brave enough to talk about their own plans because of efficiency gains and what it means. We haven't had a conversation about what a just and orderly transition would look like as we deploy these technologies. So I think, you know, the fact that Anne's working so much on this, I mean, it's such an important conversation to have, but it's far bigger as it usually is than just a conversation about the artifacts of technology itself. The social context, the political context are all essential elements in this too. 
Perfect. I want to get, we've got two people with their hands up. Thanks for your patience. We're going to get Maggie in here. Maggie, thanks for hanging on. What's your question for our panel today? Uh, thank you. It's a great discussion and I'm very passionate about ethics because I've been like, trying to actually make some differences in different, in different areas, such as like marketing or health or uh, employment, et cetera. So my question would be is, I'm sorry if I haven't been prepared because like, I don't really know what the role of the organization is and what are the, um, the steps, the, the, the actual steps that you want to take in order to bring it into life, because it's a great discussion and there is a lot of always a polemization about it, but how are you actually going to implement or you as a, as, a, as the organization basically, and how can volunteers help? It's kind of tough. That's actually directed at the WEO yeah. um, specifically. So the best advice that I think we can give there is to go ahead and follow Rich. Uh, he's already clicking on it. I can see his eyeballs going. <laughs> he's already getting Hello. a link to take you to the WEO website and yeah. connect with WEO directly. I mean, it was that organization that brought these great speakers to you today. So Simon, Walter, and Anne are all here um, thanks to the WEO for organizing this. And so I think that's a question that goes directly to the organization. And Rich is putting Andrew, that up right there in the chat. That's what that questionnaire is for. Use that questionnaire. It's going to open yes. up the conversation for everybody. So true, true. we have one more question that we want to get to, and then we're, we're almost out of time. So I want to make sure that we get Travis up here. Travis Robbins, you had, we saw that you had your hand up. Where are you, my friend, Travis? There you are. He's down here now. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for having us. It's really cool to see such a open discussion on this kind of topic. So my question isn't necessarily to anyone specifically, but with the positive characteristics of ethical leadership and what is understood by that, how can somebody be able to discern and recognize the difference between a, a leadership that is focused on a positive vision for the future and a leadership that is more rooted in a false morality? Like what are the characteristics and things to recognize in both of those? I have a comment. Uh, anything that claims to be universal and absolute, run away from it. <laughs> there is no such thing as one way. Uh, even for my deeply religious brothers and sisters, I share faith with you. Uh, there was a wiser person than I who once said, every image that we make of God may God in mercy shatter. Mm -hmm. And I encourage us to stay away from absolutes and universals. I do want to sneak this in very quickly, Rich and Sandra. Yeah. Regarding AI, one of the questions for us to ponder in the years ahead, because this is a long journey, is do we create a new colonized world, marginalized world, and asking primary questions at this point, who makes the rules? Who enforces the rules? And how do the rules get made? Uh, are gonna be huge questions going forward into our futures. AI being one of those places where we need to take serious, serious concern and attention while it brings flourishing for all of us, uh, there's another side to it that we need to pay close attention to. And Dr. I think, Walter, it, yeah. Dr. Walter, I think you about landed a plane about perfect right there for everybody. Right? <laughs> I think that was exactly. like- Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Unscripted, unplanned, but you did it like a pro. Simon, Walter, and thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today and being amazing panelists. Have you seen the chat? They're singing your praises. They're loving. Uh, and again, thank you for the WEO, the World Ethics Organization, for having all three of you join us here today. Don't go anywhere. we got some final thoughts to wrap up, but I am going to let the uh, panel st step back and relax for a moment as we wind down. And uh, Sandra, I'm just kind of curious. You. Yeah. What's kind of going through your mind as you've been so you many taking things. notes everywhere? I was. I have, I have pages and pages of notes. I mean, I think that's that that kind of shows you what what I thought of this, right? And I think it's so important because so often we will look at situations and what Walter said there at the very end, 
just enforces this. We look at situations that are occurring or starting to manifest here in on the world and on the planet, and we think somebody should do something. You know, and who is it that's going to do it? Look in the mirror. That's who it is. So like Jason had something in the in chat earlier, you know, it starts in the home. It starts actually in the mirror is where it starts. And I think that, you know, we asked ahead of time to the wonderful panelists that were here, give us some actionable steps, give us some things. And we had questions like Travis is like, how do we recognize it? What do we do moving forward? So I think this was a, a great kickoff to the conversation that the WEO is going to be continuing. And it's a great, great thing for us to focus on in the future as we're going and leading our families and our communities. And, and so just so grateful to have been here. And again, I'll, I'll echo all that. And it, it, it's great to, as someone else said, to have a safe environment to talk about what often is a sticky conversation. Uh, even as we talk about this, even as we promoted it, colleagues, friends were saying, you're going to open up that can of worms called ethics. You're really going to talk about this on a bigger <laughs> stage. And yes, we need to, we have to. And this was a rich, deep, full 360 conversation. And again, we could have gone for hours and hours, but we do want to wrap it up. So we want yeah. to respect your time. We want to let you know about this. And we also have special thanks. Th a special thanks to the World Referral Network and the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. Thanks for supporting the symposium, being connected with the WEO, and you're on the World Ethics Organization. The website is in the chat. You've got the uh, form to fill out, the beginning to donate, to volunteer, to get more involved. And they want me to pass it on to you. We look forward to further conversations like this because there are so many different angles. So there are so many different conversations we can have on epic ethics and we've only scratched the surface. So please stay in touch, follow, like, share, add your voice to it and watch for more information coming from the World Ethics Organization. My partner, Sandra D. Robinson. I'm Rich Bontrager, The Trigger. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time and being with us tonight for the inaugural Global Ethics Day event with the World Ethics Organization. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.